My name is Mark Clemenson, and uh, I travel today from Vermont, USA, where I live with my uh, wife and my youngest daughter. Uh, I first got to know the team at the Alberta camp meeting, and what a blessing that was. And I have seen how the Lord has led uh, this ministry forward. I'm a layman uh, in the orchard, working. And uh, this is my first Bible that I ever bought. It's a King James 1611 Bible. It's not the only one I use, but this was the first one I bought. And this is the one that I carry with me where I go. Uh, also, in my Bible, I carry my baptismal vow. And I believe that this is not only a baptismal vow, but it's a birth certificate and a marriage contract all wrapped into one. And I believe every commitment that this, this, this baptismal vow stands for. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, I believe in the spirit of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church. So you're going to hear me repeat the words inspired by Alan Gould White as the lesser light pointing to the greater light. Um, I was asked to come to give my personal testimony. Um, but first, what I wanted to do was lay a foundation of where I am today, and not so much where I was, but we're going to take a look at that. Um, so we're going to start to look at that first as where we are as a people in the time that we are living in as well. All the scripture that you'll see up here comes from the King James Bible, and we're going to start in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be a witness unto me. See, now one of the things that that baptismal vow stands for is that we are commissioned for service. So when you come into the church, you're commissioned to do the work that Jesus Christ has given us to do. And as we read in Acts, we're going to receive the power to do that work, and he's asking us to be a witness in the work for him. This particular shot that you see comes from Hubble Telescope. It's called the Eye Nebula. Some have called it the Eye of God. And I believe that his handiwork can be seen all around us, especially in the stars. We read in the book of Exodus chapter 3, verses, in verse 14, I am that I am. I am has sent me unto you. And I wanted to put that forward to you because today I wouldn't be here unless it was God that brought me here and God that plucked me out of the world that I was living in. And I give him the glory and the thanks for doing that. And the third scripture I wanted to open with here comes from the book of John, chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what I would ask at this time, if we would just bow our heads and close our eyes for a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, holy, holy, holy is thy name. We come before you, Lord God, on your holy Sabbath to ask for a blessing, a double blessing on your Sabbath, Lord. May our hearts be pricked by the words from on high. May we be humbled by your mercy and your grace. May we know that we are your people and that we can call you our God. Father, I ask you to set me aside and for you to be lifted up through your Son, Jesus Christ, for we ask this all in his name. Amen. Amen. This depiction we see here, many Christians think about in the ancient times of Rome where the Christians were martyred by being fed to the lions. But I did some study in the history and really Christians weren't really worthy to be in the Colosseum. Many of them were tied with living rats in gunny sacks and thrown into the river because they weren't worthy to be brought in to the Colosseum itself. And this is where we are on the edge of time right now. Are we willing to stand for it? And one of my favorite scripture texts 
comes from the book of Revelation, verse 12, and excuse me, chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So here again we see that it is Jesus who has saved us by his blood. We have seen that he is asking us to give our testimony to him, and that we should not fear even death itself. We are to accept the Bible as our only creed and hold certain fundamental beliefs to the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. Our method of scriptural interpretation, letting scripture interpret scripture line upon line, precept upon precept, is not based upon tradition, but is based upon the Bible alone. In the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6, we read, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto me, the Father, but by me. There is only one intercessor between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. And that's who we should be looking to in these last days. Not to any particular person or any particular leader, but to the King and Savior of the world. In John chapter 15, verse 10, we read, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in His love. And we're not legalist because we're in love with our Creator. And we read again in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus telling us, if you love me, keep my commandments. As I met a Baptist minister just two days ago as I was doing outreach, and he was asking me about my faith as a Seventh-day Adventist, this was the scripture that I brought to him that I'm in a love relationship with my Savior, and that is why I do what I do, by keeping his holy Sabbath day. And he did ask me to study with him, to understand more succinctly the Sabbath message from the Seventh-day Adventists. So I'm looking forward to that opportunity. But we have a wily foe, one that's about to destroy all of mankind if he could. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 tells us, and the dragon was wroth with a woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And where do we read in Revelation about the testimony of Jesus Christ? 1910, worship God for the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So here we find out that it is a dual relationship that we have with the, the prophets throughout time. And truth is going to continue to unfold and light will get greater and greater as we get to the edge of time. In both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the left and the right hand, we read in Joel and in Acts, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So as we found through the early church with not only Ellen Gould White, but other of the early pioneers, that they were having visions. These will continue to grow and happen as we get closer to the end of time as well. And I know that some people that I've been close to are having these dreams and are having these visions, and we are on the cuspus, the tipping point, of a tremendous, stupendous event that's about to take place in Earth's history, and all of the universe is watching. In 2 Timothy 2.15, we are told to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And by the pen of inspiration, we, re we read the Bible is the only rule of faith and doctrine. It is the chief cornerstone. Sister White had told her people, if you had only studied the Bible, you would not need my writings. But I've only been in the church for the last 10 years. And so her writings have helped me to further understand more quickly and succinctly what was the Lord talking about to his people in the end of time. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that will take the world captive. By the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. To all the testing time will come. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. 
are the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they will not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they, in such a crisis, cling to the Bible and the Bible only? Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden, that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief. How many people can relate to what she wrote there, where you feel like the gerbil running on the wheel, constantly just trying to keep ahead of the little things in your life, and God saying, let me take those burdens from you, and I've got some bigger things in your life that I want you to do, to step out of your comfort zone, to be a witness unto me, to go share the gospel in this last days of earth's history. But as we learn in Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. So how do we know that we hear his voice? How do we know that we're able to step down into that raging river to cross over into the promised land? It is first us acting on that impulse that God gives us. We have to step forward in faith. We have to. We read here also, the Lord is testing his people to see who will be loyal to the principles of his truth. Our work is to proclaim to the world the first, second, and third angel's messages. In our duties, we are neither to despise nor to fear our enemies. Now listen to this statement, because we're going to come to it later. To bind ourselves up by contracts with those not of our faith is not in the order of God. We are to treat them with kindness and courtesy, those who refuse to be loyal to God, but we are never, never to unite with them in the counsel regarding the vital interest of his work. Never, never are we to unite with them that have not the light of the truth. Putting our trust in God, we are to move steadily forward, doing his work, with unselfishness, in humble dependence upon him, committing to his providence, ourselves, and all that concerns our present and future, holding the beginning of our confidence firm unto the end, remembering that we receive the blessings of heaven not because of our worthiness, but because of Christ's worthiness and our acceptance through faith in him of God's abounding grace. Councils on Health, page 238. How more succinctly could she have put that? What is our work to do? To proclaim the three angels' messages. And it's not about us. It's about him who gives us the power to do this. We read in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, For my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And I'm going to take the liberty to say no created being is able to pluck us out of the Father's hand as well. Mm -hmm. Though Lucifer would like to think that he could put that on us, but God has said, no, you're not going to be able to take him out of my hand. We can freely leave his hand but he'll never let us go if we're holding on to him. In my life today, page 338, God has placed the promises in his word to lead us to have faith in him. In those promises, he draws back the veil from eternity, giving us a glimpse of the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory which awaits the overcomer. And where do we read about the overcomer? In one of the two books that Ellen White pointed to, which is the bread and the blood, Daniel and Revelation. So here we find in Revelation 2.7, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcome, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And again in Revelation, we read in chapter 3, verse 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father and before the angels. As a brother and I were talking about this morning, how is he going to make that happen 
and a universe that will be watching to that single event when God Himself confesses one individual between, in, in front of the whole host of heaven. Will time and space fold on itself so that person will be seen and recognized in front of God in the courts? And how we'll be able to throw ourselves at his feet and give him the glory for the mercy that he's given to us? And lastly, in Revelation 3.12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write upon him the name of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And we're told also that we're going to get a new name, right? That it's written in a white stone. And that no one else in the universe will have that name. So when he speaks that one name, he's speaking only to you. That one name given to you in a white stone to represent the purity and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, who is the stone, the chief cornerstone of our faith. In, in Christ's Object Lessons, in page 125, we read, All who receive the gospel message into the heart will long to proclaim it. The heaven-born love of Christ must find expression. Those who have put on Christ will relate their experience, tracing step by step the leadings of the Holy Spirit. They're hungering and thirsting for the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom He has sent, the results of the searching of the Scriptures, their prayers, their soul agony, and the words of Christ to them, thy sins be forgiven thee. It is unnatural for any to keep these things secret, and those who are filled with the love of Christ will not do so. In fact, we're told that if we try to, it actually will be a detriment. We will be quenching the Spirit of God if we try to hold back what He's trying to pour out of us to those people we meet. On my flight from Chicago to Vancouver, I prayed, Lord, give me somebody today that I can have an opportunity to witness to you. And as I was working on my presentation, I made sure I just had my laptop turned just a little bit enough so the person next to me could see what I was working on. And he didn't strike up a conversation with me. So I thought, okay, Lord, what do I do? I've got to find an, an entering wedge. So I started asking who he was, where he was coming from. He was from, lives in Singapore, visiting family in Vancouver, raised in a Christian family. And for the next two and a half hours, I was able to share with him the gospel message, the three angels' messages, and the people sitting around us were listening to the conversation as well. So every moment we have an opportunity to have a divine appointment, that God has established for us. And we are to make sure that we take the time to fulfill what God has given us. But we're in danger as a people. We are a people of Laodicea, a church that's asleep. And unfortunately, sometimes we're listening to messages that put us to sleep. But it's now is the time to, to wake the people up. Romans 13, verses 11 through 12. And that knowing the time, it is now high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And as I'm going to talk about here a little bit more as we get into the testimonial experience when I first came into the truth, we are in a deep spiritual warfare, brothers and sisters. And some of us are going to have much more conflict because of where we came from. But eventually, we're all going to be standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the beast and his image. And we're going to have to be able to fight the good fight of faith by putting on the armor of light, which is what? Christ's righteous robe. That's what it is but it does not release us from the warfare that we're going to be in. Our high priest stands right now in the Holy of Holies, interceding for us as a people. He's mixing our prayers with the incense and laying them before his Father right now.
but very soon, and we don't know when, he's going to take off his priestly robe. And he's going to say, it's finished. And everybody will be sealed at that moment in time. And there will be no turning back the pages. We read in early writings, as the ministration of Jesus closed in the holy place and he passed in the holiest and stood before the ark containing the law of God, he sent another mighty angel with a third message to the world. A parchment was placed in the angel's hand and as he descended to the earth with power and majesty, he proclaimed a fearful warning with the most terrible threatening ever born to man. This message was designed to put the children of God upon their guard by showing them the hour of temptation and anguish that was before them. Said the angel, they will be brought into close combat with the beast and his image. Their only hope of eternal life is to remain steadfast. Although their lives are at stake, they must hold fast the truth. When I was a young man growing up in high school and junior high, I was a gifted athlete. And I used to play football, American football. And I loved to be on the field of play. So I played both offense and defense, and I played special teams. I never wanted to be on the bench. Never. And now we're in our final moments of time and there's a warfare on the field and the Lord is looking at the bench and he's saying, who's going to get into the game and finish this game with me? Are we willing to get out of our comfort zone and step forward in faith to go forward to be a witness unto him in these last moments of verse history? In Gospel Workers, page 251, we read, we talk about the first angel's message and the second angel's message, and we think we have some understanding of the third angel's message. Now listen to this. But as long as we are content with a limited knowledge, we shall be disqualified to obtain clearer views of truth. He who holds forth the word of life must take time to study the Bible and to search his own heart. Neglecting this, he will not know how to minister to needy souls. The diligent, humble student, seeking by earnest prayer and study for the truth as it is in Jesus, will most surely be awarded. He seeks for help not from the ideas of human writers, but from the fountain of wisdom and knowledge and under the guidance of holy intelligence. He gains a clear understanding of truth. So are we willing to have a limited knowledge of the third angel's message? No. No is our reply. Because soon there's going to be a fourth angel that comes down to meet the third angel to give it great exceeding power and to even open up further the sins that are in the church and to lay Babylon wide open. And we're going to take a little scratch at that service with my testimony a little bit later. In Council to Writers, Editors, page 175, we have a most important work to do the work of proclaiming the third angel's message. We are facing the most important issues that men have ever been called to meet. All should understand the truths contained in the three messages. Now listen to this. For they are essential to what? Salvation itself. Imagine that. That even our salvation is dependent upon our understanding of the word of God as it relates to the third angel, three angels' messages. The book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, the bread and the blood. We are to take from these and be prepared to stand against an apostate world and show them from the word of God who we are and why we live the way we live. Because eventually, brothers and sisters, this book is going to be taken away from us. Do you believe that? And I know up in Canada, some consider it already a hate crime for some of the teachings out of this book. So are we going to have scripture into memory? Are we going to have the ability to, to pull things at a, at a moment's notice? when these books are taken away from us and we're standing in our, in our test. 
The third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which will enlighten the earth with its glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in its advancing glory. Who is willing to stand back? And who is willing to go forward? It's going to go forward with or without us. And I'd rather be on the field of play. Because I know who wins the game. And I know who's the coach and the captain of the team. And all he's looking for is some human instruments to work through, to finish the work with. But we've got a work to do. Revelation 18.4 tells us, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that you receive none of her plagues. As the depiction here shows ancient Babylon, as they will rebuild it again, as they are trying to do now, into the Tower of Babel that will be again on the earth today. So we're calling people out. We're calling people out from all of the different denominations, all of the different uh, belief systems, I was fortunate enough to, to attend the ASI conference in Orlando this year, and a friend that I met down there, Roderick, an Australian man, has spent the last three and a half years witnessing to the Muslim nation. The largest population of Muslims outside of the Middle East is around Detroit, Michigan. And one of the most powerful imams in the world has been listening to this simple man, a layman, and his nephew. And he made a worldwide proclamation to all of the imams of the Muslim nation that the Seventh-day Adventists was not a Christian denomination. He said that they were the people of the book that God foretold about that would come at the end of time. And he made that as a worldwide proclamation to all of the Muslims to understand we have found the people of the book and they're right here, right now. So look how the Lord is putting things together so quickly. In the great controversy, if you haven't read it, read it. If you haven't read it in a while, read it again. Page 604. But God still has a people in Babylon. And before the visitation of his judgments, these faithful ones must be called out and they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence the movement symbolizing the angel coming down from heaven, lighting the earth with the glory and crying mightily with a strong voice. And I underline this, announcing the sins of Babylon. The secular world's doing a better job than God's last day people doing this. In connection with the message, the call is heard, come out of her, my people. These announcements uniting with the third angel's message constitutes the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. I believe we are at the moment in time that the Lord is ready to pour out that fourth angel's power to us to meet the third angel's message. And again in Great Controversy, page 606, Thus the message of the third angel will be proclaimed as the time it comes to be given with the greatest power. The Lord will work with, through humble instruments, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid wide open. The fearful results of enforcing of the observance of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like this. And in fact, Sister White writes that the message is to go back to the eastern United States and she kept saying, repeat the message, repeat the message, repeat the message. And I feel fortunate that I am alive and living in the Northern New England Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and I live just down the road from the William Miller Farm where it all began. And I'm so thankful that I'm living here in this part of time 
to be a partaker with him. And we see through this illustration, it's a threefold union that's taking place. And again, the great controversy, page 588, through the two great errors of immortality of his soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be the foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country, the United States, will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Now it's interesting to note that there are only three city-states in the world. There's Washington, D.C., the apostate Protestant nation. There's the Vatican, the beast of the sea. And then there's the square mile in London, England where spiritualism has its headquarters, where all of the world's banks and trading takes place under the watchful eye of the Masonic system. This is an illustration of what spiritualism means. As it was said in the garden, ye shall not surely die, but ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So around and around in reincarnation on the wheel of life, the soul does not die, but it, it keeps ascending and transcending through the spirits. As a young child, this is what I was taught to believe. Sister White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 685, modern spiritualism in the forms of ancient witchcraft and idol worship, all having communion with the dead as their vital principle, are founded upon the first lie which Satan beguiled Eve in Eden. Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in that day that ye eat thereof, ye shall be his gods. Alike based upon the falsehood and perpetuating the same, they are alike from the father of lies. So we read earlier from the great controversy, this is the foundation of this threefold union of spiritualism that this whole great Babylonian system is coming together with. And again, what constitutes Babylon? The threefold union of the beast of the sea, which is the papacy, the beast of the earth, the apostate Protestants, and the beast of the bottomless pit, spiritualism. And it's all founded on the sun worship system, astrology. And we're not going to take time to look at that, but that's Satan's number one religion. It always has been, and it will be, for he is the sun god, and he has his day of worship that he wants. Now, in 2001, the Lord called me out. I grew up in an Illuminati family. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that term means. But at the time in my life, I was a, a career man working for this global company. Many of you recognize IBM, International Business Machines. I was at the pinnacle of my career. I don't have a college degree, but I was asked to be in the IBM think tank. Less than 100 people in the world with a corporation of 350,000 employees and 400,000 contractors. They asked me to join. I was nominated. And the first meeting I went to was there were 13 people in the room at a round table. And we went around and we introduced ourselves. And when it came to me, I said, I don't have the credentials to be in this room. And they said, no, Mark, you've got a gift that we need to tap into because we're going to bring this company into the new millennium. And we need your abilities to help get this message out. See, now under the sign of astrology, I was an Aquarian, which is the bringer of knowledge. And so I was being groomed to be one to bring knowledge. But I ended up at this place, with the William Miller Farm. So I was working in New York City, and through a friend of my father, I bought a camp in upstate New York. And I would travel sometimes, and I would go by this little sign on the road, William Miller Farm. 
And the reason why I recognized it was because I was starting to read about God and Adventism. I had a gentleman, Bobby Richardson, and uh, Bobby and I just reconnected recently in the last couple months from almost 11 years ago. And him and I used to travel quite a bit. And uh, he would leave after dinner and go up to his hotel room. And I never really understood why. I would stay down with customers and clients and, and we'd have cocktails and stay up and, and talk. And I asked Bobby one night, I said, what do you do? He says, well, I go up to my room and I read my Bible. I said, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. You read your Bible, okay. See, at this point in my life, in my career, I didn't realize how I was being groomed and manipulated. And Bobby was talking to me about what was going on with me being asked to join the think tank and me being asked to participate in these um, sessions of uh, bringing the company to this new millennium. And he said, Mark, have you ever heard of the term Illuminati? And I had never heard of it. And so I got out on the internet and I started Googling Illuminati and I went and found there were some books that popped up and this author William Sutton I went and bought his books from Amazon.com and I started reading them and interestingly enough I was also reading the Bible by that point too I knew my 1611 Bible so here the Lord was already leading me to find the truth. And you see now the people on the other side, my family, my bloodline, started realizing that I was slipping out of their grasp. But there was something very interesting because, you know, I went to the Methodist Church, and I went to the Baptist Church, and I went to the Pentecostals. I even went back to the Roman Catholic Church. But the Lord had already impressed in my heart that the Ten Commandments were still valid. And I was asking these people, why don't you keep the Sabbath? Why don't you keep the Sabbath? And I didn't realize that there was a Christian denomination that kept the Sabbath. I hadn't found it at that point. Now I realize that there are over 500 of them in the world. And the Seventh-day Adventist is only one of those 500. So these books pointed me to the truth. And so I looked in the, who was the publisher of the book, and I called the publishing house, and they were in upstate New York. So I asked that I wanted to speak to the author, and they said, well, we don't know where he is. We just sent a royalty check to a P.O. box, and what are you looking for, Mark? And I said, I know what he's writing about. I'm living it. I've lived it. And then they asked me to come to a convocation on Sabbath. So I showed up on Sabbath afternoon, and everybody had a Bible. Actually, Sabbath morning, everybody had a Bible and they were studying the Word of God. And when I left that afternoon, I was leaving with not only my Bible, but a copy of The Great Controversy and The Desire of Ages. And at that point, I was consuming everything that I could get my hands on. I read both those books in three weeks, and I was convinced, this is God's last day people. This is it. I was convinced. Six months later, I was baptized into the church. Six months later. Now, something I, I want to tell you too that happened in my life at that time, there were times I was out of balance with what I was studying. And I was talking to uh, a brother about this earlier. That how much do we want to study the evil or the devil? How far down that rabbit hole do you want to go? Because you'll end up in the devil's lair if you go down there too far and too long. So I had to rebalance my life and make sure that Christ was first and foremost. But I was ready to peel that onion layer back. And the great controversy said, lay the sins of Babylon wide open, Mark. Now as an Adventist, I was starting to get publications and there was a magazine, some of you may get it, Adventist Review. You've heard of that? And I was astonished by this article that I found in the Adventist Review magazine. And it says, Salvation Army Adventist theologians meet in dialogue. 
Now see, when I read the article, it's, it's very difficult to see, but I underlined it at the very bottom here. It talks about the founders of the Salvation Army, Catherine and William Booth. You see, and I had a little history about that family that the Adventists didn't know about because William Booth adopted my grandfather. And there was another side of William Booth that the world didn't know about. Now remember earlier where we read never, never to unite with those? We are to treat them with kindness, but we are never, never to unite with them in God's work. And here we are figuring out how we might partner together is the statement in the article. The Salvation Army is one of the leading proponents of the Sunday Law in the world today. And their entire structure is set up like the Jesuit order. And we're going to take a look at this a little bit as we peel this onion layer back. Early writings in 1882, if God has any new light to communicate, he will let his chosen and beloved understanding it without their going to have their minds enlightened by hearing those who are, are in what? darkness and an error. I was shown the necessity of those who believe that we are having the last message of mercy being separate from those who are daily abiding in new errors. I saw that neither young nor old should attend their meetings, for it was wrong to thus encourage them while they teach error, that is a deadly poison to the soul, and teach for doctrines the commandments of men the influence of such gatherings is not good. So she went further to said what? Don't even touch the unclean thing. Amen. So as we read in that earlier comments on, on councils on health, what? We are never, never to unite with him in council regarding the vital interests of his work. We're not. Here is a picture of both William and Catherine Booth. Now, interestingly enough, you know, I, I've done a lot of study on that family. And uh, he was a great missionary. He did a great work in London, going into the brothels and into the bars and getting people out and, and preaching the gospel message. But there was another side to him that no one really understood. He became the founder and the first general of the Salvation Army in 1912. Now, you notice the logo? We see it everywhere, right? And there are a lot of good people in there that are doing a great work that love the Lord. Now, something interesting here is that William Booth himself was a 33rd degree Freemason. The founder of the Salvation Army adopted the Red Shield logo for the Christian ministry, and Red Shield pronounced Rothschild in German. You see, William Booth had a venture capitalist by the name of Nathaniel Rothschild that financed the establishment of the Salvation Army. And what he did was he asked William Booth to go to India to establish his new territory. Now the Rothschild dynasty had already established quite an industry in India already through a company called the East India Trading Company the largest opium drug dealer in the world. And they needed a front. And where do you think they fronted the proceeds? So my grandfather, who was then taken as a small boy to India, up into near Tibet, was then taught and raised by Jesuits in the mystery schools of the Himalayas. And then my father and my uncle were both born in India and also went to the same mystery schools of the Jesuits in the Himalaya mountains. So I was being groomed as part of the family bloodline to partake. Now my grandfather ended up working for the East India Trading Company. He ended up becoming the leader of a white lodge of Freemasonry. In North America we see blue lodges. And Blue Lodges symbolizes that it's a narrower amount of light. They don't have all the truth. 
whereas the White Lodge has all the spectrum of light. And so when my grandfather died, he gave my father his Masonic apron, and then that was being passed down to me as well. So here I was, I was at a tipping point at my career at IBM. I had realized what I was being groomed to do. And some of the things, the technologies we were working on, we, we had a, a saying, you would get industrial amnesia after you left the meeting. She couldn't talk about it. There were things that went on, corruption in high places. I worked with accounts from the United Nations right down to the local law enforcement in the state agencies. And unfortunately, there's a lot of bad people, but there are a lot of good people in those places too. And that's our job again, to call them out of Babylon and bring them into the truth. So in Darjeeling, Gothels is where both my grandfather and father were raised on the border of Tibet. I remember my father sharing a story with me when they used to go up to the, the monasteries of the Tibetan monks and they would watch the monks levitating 80, 100 feet in the air and how astonished they were by it. Now, in their teaching was known as the Luciferianism. And I pulled these definitions off of Wikipedia because I think they do a good job of kind of explaining what Luciferianism means. Because they don't believe in Satan per se. Luciferianism is the embodiment of knowledge that acknowledges the principles of Lucifer as the light of conscious evolution. As a god or as a principle, Lucifer is the light bearer. We know that from the scripture. The light which illuminates the consciousness of sapient beings and heightens the senses and awarenesses to experience higher levels of being. You're on that reincarnation wheel going round and round and you're trying to rise up through your chakras till you become a Mahatma. Luciferianism, the path of self-attainment. It's the higher self. It is the centered path, neither left nor right. For Lucifer is the star that shines in the morning and evening, the point of the light between opposing forces. It is the symbol of the yin-yang, which I had branded on my body because I was understanding the pure teaching of Luciferianism as the self-attainment. Now we also have another definition Spiritual Luciferianism has its roots in the esoteric teachings of Western occultism and hermeticism. This view holds that while Satan represents the manifestation of the material realm, Lucifer represents the spiritual, highest spiritual idea, one's true will, the holy guardian angel. As all material things are energy or light, Lucifer is seen as the creating force of the universe, ever present. Interestingly to hear, they add, some classically educated Freemasons use Luciferian in their scholarly senses of bringing enlightenment, invoking Prometheus, who stole the fire from the gods to bring to man. So as I was growing up, and I was meeting these illuminated beings, who I believed were my dead ancestors, again, his foundation is spiritualism. I thought I was being brought into the true understanding of one's self-awareness and attaining the higher self. And it started at a very young age. Let's look at the definition of a Freemason, a member of a major fraternal organization called Free and Accepted Masons or Ancient Free and Accepted Masons that has certain secret rituals. I've talked to many Masons. Uh, recently I spoke in a church in New Hampshire and I was given my testimony and a gentleman stood up and he turned to the entire congregation and he said, I have an announcement to make. I'm a 32nd degree Freemason. And what I have seen today from what Mark has shared, I want to come out. And I want you to know that I want to come out. So we brought him in, we did a season of prayer around him and right now he's working to be baptized finally into the church away from Freemasonry. Now interestingly enough, 
William Miller was the highest ranking Freemason of the order of his time. I have a copy of his letter of resignation he gave to the Lodge when he came into the truth. I believe that some of the people that will be closest to the throne of God have been Satan's chief agents here on earth. So we're not to count any of them out. And again, let's look at the term here, Illuminati. It means any various groups claiming special religious enlightenment. Persons who are claimed to be unusually enlightened. And we're going to dig a little deeper into this term because it's being thrown around a lot in society today, in movies, within the church, and uh, people, oh, you know, conspiracy theory, what does that mean? But let's go to the American Heritage Dictionary, published in 1969. After this time, they removed this definition. They removed it. It says that the Illuminati are persons claiming to be unusually enlightened, which we read in Webster's Dictionary. But it goes on to say, persons regarded as atheist, we know about them with the 1798, libertarian, radical Republicans. They were involved down in America with the 14th Amendment. And then it goes on to call them encyclopedist, Freemasons, and Jacobins. So the Illuminati is a cell of Freemasonry itself. And I'm going to show you from their own writings. Even George Washington stated publicly in 1798, that's an important date for us as Adventists, that he acknowledged that Illuminati activity had come to the U.S. He stated, it is not my intention to doubt the doctrine of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism had spread to the United States. On the contrary, no one is more satisfied the fact than I am. You see, in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte, in the reign of terror, exiled the Pope, right? And we're not going to study this in detail, but Napoleon and all of his brothers were Freemasons. And they vowed to take back the Vatican after the Vatican to destroy, try to destroy the Knights Templars hundreds and hundreds of years before. And so now we have the Masons in the Vatican from 1798. And then in 18, I believe it's 22, they reinstate the Jesuit order. So here are these two groups are now working together. Here's another Booth related to the Booth family. In American history, we had to learn about it. Some may know about this man. He was an assassin. His name was John Wilkes Booth. And he killed Abraham Lincoln. He shot Abraham Lincoln on April 4th. He was related to the same family that my father's grandfather was adopted into. I'm going to look at a little bit of interesting history here. In order to begin a movement that would lead to the secession of the South from the Union, we're talking about down in the United States, the Illuminati used the Knights of the Golden Circle, which had been informed in 1854 by George W.A. Bickley to spread racial tension known as Hegel's dialectic process. We're not going to talk about that, but basically it is divide and conquer from state to state using slavery as an issue. Wartime members included Jefferson Davis, John Wilkes Booth, Jesse James. They were all Masons. The Ku Klux Klan was formed in 1867, and this was the military arm of the Knights. So here we see how another secret society is working together in conjunction. We go on and we read further from the Modern History Project during the American Civil War, it was who? The Rothschilds that financed both sides of the conflict. The reason leading to this Civil War, Van Helsing wrote, were almost completely due to the actions and provocations of the Rothschild agents themselves. The Rothschilds run the banking industry over in the square mile. And that's why we need to know so we can understand the third angel's message in its entirety. 
of calling people out. This is the worldwide headquarters of Freemasonry. Does anybody have any idea where it is? Washington, D.C. So it's in one of the city-state capitals. You can see it almost looks like an Egyptian motif. And interestingly enough, this is located 13 blocks north of the White House. And that's very important in the occult world. We're not going to spend time on that. But even Washington, D.C. itself is laid out in a giant Masonic grid pattern as they were preparing the United States to be the new Atlantis as we're coming into the dawning of the new age as they ride, they're trying to reinstate Atlantis again. So the main library of the Supreme Council 33rd degree of the ancient accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, the Mother Supreme Council of the World, Washington, D.C., is dedicated to the Confederate General Albert Pike, the KKK's chief judiciary. And in this Masonic temple, the Albert Pike Memorial Room inside the Supreme Council 33, which is again located 13 blocks directly north of the White House in Washington, D.C., now, I met a family whose husband was a 32nd degree Freemason, a Shriner. And so when you go to become a 33rd degree, you go here. This is the only place you go in North America. And it's an honorary rite. And he was brought into this room, waiting room, with other candidates. And individually, they're brought out in front of a host of people. And they asked them, who are you willing to submit your oath to? And he didn't know what the answer was. So they shoveled him back into the waiting room. And at this time, his family was outside praying for him to get out. He sat, he turned to the man next to him and he said, who am I swearing an oath to? And the man said, to Lucifer. And he got up and walked out and resigned from the lodge. Now we can actually find here in Isaiah 14, chapter, chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will send into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Because it's all about self-attainment. And we're going we're to peel this onion layer back a little bit and we're going to look at some characteristics in the Bible itself of what I call the children of disobedience. Sister White wrote, those who stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel cannot be united with Freemasonry or with any secret organization, the seal of the living God will not be placed upon anybody who maintains such a connection after the light of truth has shone upon their, their pathway. Christ is not divided and Christians cannot serve God and mammon. The Lord says, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be a father unto you and ye shall also be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So here again, touch not the unclean thing come out. In fact, she went on to say that those who stay in this connection will lose their soul. Plain and simple. Lose their soul. If you remember any text from the Spirit of Prophecy tonight, try to keep this one. Because this is the tipping point of where we're at. A power from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are binding themselves together in secret societies. So when church leaders or church elders say to me, that's conspiracy theory. Those are opinions. I can go to the spirit of prophecy and say, see what Sister White wrote? And she said in other writings, if we are to study the mystery of iniquity, we will study the secret societies. And that will unfold it even further by doing that. 
Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he shall hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. So here we see this battle, especially over money. Power we give to money and currency. And in 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, For the love of money is what? The root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When are we going to be cut off? Soon. I believe soon. I believe that we're living at the very time of the close of probation. I believe that we are going to see the close of probation very shortly. In the United States, we have a system called the Federal Reserve. And for some of those who know, it's not a federal agency at all. It's a private bank. 51% shareholder is the House of Rothschild. And in their communique, uh, one of the statements was, permit me to issue and control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. They went on to say in a communique um, written in 1863, the few who understand the system will either be so interested in its profits and so dependent upon its favors, there will be no opposition from that class, while on the other hand, the great body of people mentally incapable of comprehending the tremendous advantages will bear its burden without complaint and perhaps without suspecting that the system is inimical, hostile to the best interest. The goyim, the little people, as the BP executive said, the little people, they'll bear the brunt. And boy, we're going to bear it, that's for sure. But we've got to remember, who are we going to serve? Lord Jesus Christ, or are we going to serve the world? These three symbols represent the Masonic apron, which when I was given my grandfather's Masonic apron, it had three solar bursts on it because they have a, con what you would call a um, counterfeit to the triunion Godhead. And then the clasp that held this apron, which you see in the top corner, is the Illuminati symbol of the serpent eating its tail, that ye shall not surely die, but ye shall be as God. So I had the three solar burst, and then the clasp which closed it, and then below is my family's crest, which actually sits on the Vatican floor, because I'm a descendant of Pope Clement of over 700 years ago. That's how far back my family's been caught up in this bloodline of secret societies. And so that's why I was being groomed for what's coming. The three Bible characteristics of the children of disobedience. First we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 14 and 15, and no mar marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing that his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. It's a works-based system, self-attainment. Second scripture here from Matthew 24, verses 24 through 26. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. It's a workspace system that meet in secret chambers. If anybody's ever attempted to get into a lodge, they have the upper room, another counterfeit to the biblical history of Jesus Christ in the upper room, where only the highest masons can enter into the secret chambers. And lastly, into the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for good and it was a pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, and she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat, then their eyes of them were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves aprons. The Masonic 
apron of wisdom. And what is it made of? Lamb skin. What a front to the first lamb that was sacrificed for the sins that Adam and Eve did when God clothed them with the lamb skin. And because the Masonic system is based on fertility rites, that apron covers the Holy of Holies. That's their teaching. What a affront to Christianity. And this is something that I used to do. Levitation. I was a full adept transcendental meditationist by the time I was 12 years old because I had been given the gift through my family's bloodline. Clairvoyance, telekinesis, astral projection, levitation, all things that I thought were normal behavior. And I would talk to my friends at school and they'd say, Martin, we don't know what you're talking about, but it's, uh, it's out of this world. And I'm like, come on, you can do this. I had it down to a science. I get home from school, I go to my room, 20 minutes in my mantra, and I was out of my body. Or I'd be levitating off the bed. But did I know what was lifting me off the bed at the time? Devils? No, I didn't know that. And right away there were these illuminated ones right there willing to show me the way. And I've seen some pretty fascinating things that probably would institutionalize some people if they saw them today. So this is where I was. This is the life that I grew up and understood. But it wasn't until I read the Bible in Deuteronomy in chapter 18 where God said that these are an abomination. You know, let's read it. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. They shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. That's a Masonic ritual. Or use divination, which we know is fortune telling, or observer of times, astrologer, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consultor with familiar spirits, or a wizard, a necromancer, one that conjures up spirits. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God drove them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. And how do we become perfect with him? By putting on the armor of light, Christ's robe of righteousness. And everything is blotted out. But that robe of righteousness is also our armor for spiritual warfare. Chapter 16, 26 of Matthew, For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man gain in exchange for his soul? So here I was at the tipping point in my life. I'm on upstate New York. I'm in my, this camp that I bought from a friend of my father's. I'm, I'm trying to quit my career at IBM, making hundreds of thousands of dollars, rubbing elbows with very prestigious people offered to be a part of these elite groups and I'm wrestling with this and wrestling with this and where I'm standing on the back of the house there was a, a lake and the river that came down where the lake joined and right across it was the intelligence center for the state police barracks and the Defar Department of Environmental Conservation forest rangers, which actually have more authority than the state police in the states. And, I, and it's about midnight, and I see all this activity going on, and so I go and grab a pair of binoculars, and I look out, and here are all these guys. Full regalia, Masonic aprons on, and I'm like, Lord, what have I got myself into? And so I'm standing there on the deck and I'm panning and all of a sudden I stop and I'm looking and there's a pair of crosshairs looking down my scope. I'm looking into his scope and he's got a rifle pointed at my head. So I wave and he nods back at me and I, I drop to my knees. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. What am I to do? This is in the middle of nowhere. 
And it's a dark, dark county, completely under their control. And I realize they're not, they're not on the other side of the lake anymore. Well, they're coming around. They're coming for me. And I'm praying, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? This is it. And small, still voice, Mark, take your shoes and socks off and go outside and tell them you belong to me. Okay, Lord. Okay. So I took off my shoes. I took off my socks. I jumped off the back of the deck. I'm walking out into the woods. And next thing I'm standing in front of this thing, 20 feet tall in front of me. The God of the dead, the Lord of the underworld, Anubis. And next to him, he's stacking souls wrapped in gunny sacks with their eyes cut out, tied up, wriggling. And he's talking to me, saying, I've already got your soul, Mark. And next thing I know is I look at him and I say, you can have my body, but you can't have my soul. I've given it to the Lord. This thing vanishes. These men around me are all backing away. And then this small, still voice says, Mark, go inside. This is not your battle. So I go inside, went to bed, got up the next morning, went into town, saw some of the men in the diner, asking me how I slept that night. I said, I slept great. Thank you very much. Got a phone call from my oldest friend, my father. And he said, if you get out from behind his shadow, you'll end up with a bullet in your head. I'm telling you as your father, we can't touch you. Don't get out from behind his shadow. It's been a long time since my dad and I reconnected after that. And I still pray for him because he's been totally deceived by this system. Totally deceived. Sister White writes about, as we near the close of time, there will be greater and still greater eternal parade of heathen power. Heathen deities will manifest their signal power and will exhibit themselves before the cities of the world. And this delineation has already begun to be fulfilled. By a variety of images, the Lord Jesus represented to John the wicked character and seductive influence of those who have been distinguished for the persecution of God's people. She went on to write in manuscript releases, all need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of verse history. God's presentation of the detestable works of the inhabitants of the ruling powers of this world who bind themselves together into secret societies and confederacies. Not honoring the law of God should enable the people who have the light of the truth to keep clear of these evils. More and more will false religionists of the world manifest their evil doings, for there are but two parties, those who keep the commandments of God and those who war against God's holy law. It's going to be totally black and white pretty soon. Totally black and white. I wanted to throw this in here quickly. The altar to Hermes, which is in the United Nations meditation room. The altar to Hermes. The word Hermes means son of Ham. And where do we know about Ham? He was a son of Noah. Ham had three sons. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. We're told that Ham got drunk slept with his father. Ham begot Cush, and Cush begot Nimrod. Cush was the ringleader. Nimrod was the tool. And we read in the Masonic teachings, you can't see it here very well, that Nimrod, the king of Babylon and Assyria, it had been attributed the first organization of fraternity of craftsmen to him and saying that he gave a charge to the workmen 
whom he is to assist the king of Nineveh in the building of cities. Nimrod is considered the first master mason. It's to him they point to. And what did Nimrod do? He snubbed his nose at God. Just like they're snubbing the nose at him today. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. He's knocking at all of our hearts. And I think that at least one person in your life, either you're going to meet or you already know, that is either deceived or lost in this system, needs your prayers, needs the truth, and needs to see Christ's character revealed in you so that we can pull them out of Babylon. The reason why the Lord told me to take my shoes and socks off, I didn't realize this until I read this later in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. For you are standing is holy ground. So here is my my God interceding on my behalf and saying, he's mine. He's not yours. He's mine. I owe him everything. Am I willing to die for him as a witness? Only he knows. This testimony has touched many lives over many years and has brought some great persecution in my life too. And I'm telling you, don't be afraid. For perfect love casts out all fear. Amen. God is looking for a people who are willing to stand for truth. You see, there's the battlefield. Not so much the analogy of the game anymore. There's the battlefield. And in ancient times, those who went before all of the soldiers were who? the standard bearers. And they're all out in the middle of this battlefield and they're holding the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. And they're looking behind them and most of the people have run scared. And they're telling them, come back. And the Lord's and his people are saying, no, come forward. This is where we are today. This is where we're going to stand. This is, the, this is the line in the sand that we're going to draw. We're not going to water down the third angel's message anymore. We're going to lay the sins of Babylon wide open for the whole world to see. We're going to allow this deception to be exposed for what it is in the banking system and in the other systems, the Hollywood, the music industry, the the way that they've polluted our food, our air, everything. It's time for us to expose it. Now, in Ephesians 2.8 we read, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, but it's a gift from God. Always remembering it's Him that gave us the gift. And are we willing to stand to fight the good fight of faith? And I want to just get a couple more slides in closing here. This is counsel to writers and editors. Precious truth must be presented in its native force. The deceptive errors that are widespread and that are leading the world captive are to be unveiled. Every effort possible is being made to ensnare souls with subtle reasonings and to turn them from truth to fables and to prepare them to deceive strong delusions. But while these deceived souls turn from the truth to error, do not speak them one word of censure. Seek to show these poor deluded souls their danger and to reveal to them their grievous is their course of action towards Jesus Christ. But let it all be done in pitying tenderness. By a proper manner of labor, some of the souls who are ensnared by Satan will be recovered from his power. But do not blame and condemn them. To ridicule the position held by those who are in error will not open their blind eyes. 
nor attract them to the truth. You've got to keep going and praying and going and praying, as I have been for years now for my family. Years. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou moved, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that these things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. It's a promise. That's a promise. As my older daughter came in the church, was baptized, and left a year later, she's promised me, though, she's going to come back. And I cannot doubt his promise. And our high priest is telling us, 1 Peter 2.9, but you are chosen as what? A generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that he hath showed forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. We are his peculiar people living on the tipping point of a stupendous crisis. And are we willing again to fight the good fight of faith? My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And if you read on, it says because of the lack of the knowledge, even in the commandments themselves. You know, I, I, I hear in Adventist circles, we get so hung up on the fourth commandment. And we haven't even gotten through the second. You call yourself a Christian? I was talking to a brother today. If your family and your friends don't recognize you as a Christian, you're probably not a Christian. So calling yourself one is blaspheming God. And I think if we were to look more at the second commandment, the fourth would come very easily into the mix. It would be by our nature. And lastly, as we close with the, the Revelation 12, 11, and Daniel standing in the lion's den, what a spectacular testimony he is to give to all of us about the angel that came down and closed the mouths. What a man of faith. What a man of faith. So are we to overcome by the blood of the lamb? Who? Satan. And by the word of our testimony and love not our lives unto the death. I want to make an appeal. Anybody tonight who is willing to go and find somebody that they know that's lost in this system, this week coming up, not next week, not down the road, this week you're going to call them, you're going to go to their home, and you're going to tell them how much you love them and how much you want them to know how much you love them, and you're going to put them in your prayer life, and you're going to make sure that you believe the promise that they're going to be brought into the kingdom of God. I want you to raise your hand. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, Abba, Lord, it is you that we come before to consecrate our hearts to. Lord, help our unbelief. We know we are living in perilous times, and we are so caught up with the things of this world that we are blinded to some of the simple things that you put before us. Help us to realize, Lord, the simple things that you put in our lives and to unclutter our minds Help us to be better stewards of your word. Help us to be better witnesses. Lord, we ask that you would continue to grow and strengthen those who are here represented in their families. Bind them together, Lord, in the love that you showed to us through the sacrifice of your son that we may come to realize in our finite minds just a taste of that love that you have for us, that we may share it with somebody else. 
We praise Thee and we thank Thee in Jesus' holy name. Amen.